Uncles. Hello. Uh, Hello. Uh, hey there, fellas. You know, uh, it, we have a very special guest today, and uh, I'm, I'm very excited to have this conversation. I think it's going to be a really cool thing for our listeners and maybe even us. Um, we have a former Pentecostal minister, now turned atheist, and a man here to share a pretty amazing story with us. His name is Dave Warnock, who is clearly a man of poor judgment as he is spending some of his very finite time here with we three jackasses. Dave, welcome to the show. Well, uh, thank welcome. you. Glad to be here. We're glad to have you. Now, um, just so you know, we, we, we have a segment we do here on the show, uh, and it's actually the segment we take our catchy little name from. Uh, and it's, it's a how-to segment for people leaving or who've recently left religion and have no tools or training or who left religion thing. a long time ago and they just don't know what the fuck they're doing. R even right. Then, even mm -hmm. then. So things like how to drink or how to watch R-rated movies or how to read for pleasure, etc. But today's may be our most significant how-to, which until we come up with a different name for it, the working title is <clears throat> How to Die or How to Contend with Your Own Death and How to Be the Best Sort of Friend and Ally and Partner to Somebody Going Through That Process. Mm -hmm. So... I wonder, Dave, if before we get to the heart of that subject, if you could give us a few minutes on your super interesting journey from, from you know, a Pentecostal church to, to atheism. Yes, that, that was a long journey. Um, I was converted as a Jesus in the Jesus movement in the 70s. Um, oh, that's a fun one. Yeah, I uh, got caught up in, in the charismatic Jesus movement as an 18-year-old, impressionable, vulnerable young man. So I rode that wave for the next three and a half decades or so. And, and, oh, my God. And my life was uh, in, in two or three different congregations of what, mostly evangelical, charismatic, independent, non-denominational type churches. That's a lot of different names to describe <laughs> churches that are led by a charismatic leader who rules the world that, that everyone lives in. And it's very unhealthy and very... Um, <laughs> rife with abuse of all kinds um right but that was something which I is was shocking who of. would have thought that that could happen I yeah know, right? you're, break, you're breaking news here dave you give christian you, context that you seems give a impossible. guy yeah you give a guy power and he abuses it who would think right um right. now when you join the jesus movement do do they give you your a tambourine or do you have to buy it like yeah, what's the no it grows out of your hand it, it, <laughs> okay perfect it's something that the holy spirit does it's it's it's, it's very natural and and, and that that's an ind indicator of someone who's truly in the faith. If they grow a tambourine, if you don't, then you really never right. did believe. Right. When, exactly. when you're born again, uh, your hands start turning into exactly. instruments. It's, nice. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> so that was my life for the uh, my in complete adult life from the age of 18 to about the age of 56 or 55. And that was about seven years ago. And that's and not just as a believer. You were a pro. I was a professional Christian. Yes. Um, the difference between a, an amateur and a professional is the professional gets paid. Um, right. So I, I, and it was uh, off and on. It wasn't like this uh, arc of, of you go to seminary and become a minister and you're a minister for however many years. It was, I was a lay leader many times. I had my own businesses often. I worked as, as on staff at churches at different times. And so it was up and down, in and out, just a hodgepodge of some kind of a weird life that, I just got, you know, it just rolls along. And then after all those decades in it and, and living and raising a family in it and finally coming to the conclusion that it's all false, it's it's quite a um, quite a shocking development, to be honest. That's that is a hell of a thing to go through mm -hmm. when you when when ev when your whole life is tied up into a thing. And I think a lot of our listeners can identify with that. When your whole life is tied up with a thing, it's literally got tendrils running through every part of your existence and then you go oh shit what if this isn't real that's yeah. that's a hell of a thing and everybody you know's in it and everybody you know's living in the bubble and, and thinks alike and talks alike and all of a sudden you don't and you try to identify with them and it's like you're now speaking to aliens um and it's it's very disorienting because you don't i didn't know anyone at, on a personal level that had been through it so I start looking online to try to find connections with people, and and it, it was a very uh, traumatic, disorienting period of time. Can I ask you what what was the thing that kind of set this path in motion for you? It was a, a, a personal loss uh, in a time when I thought, okay, God, you need to help me out here. Uh, 
my, with my daughters. And I wasn't getting anything out of God. I wasn't getting anything out of church leaders denominationally and locally. And I, I just was crying out. And, you know, people cry out to God all the time without answers, obviously, um, because he's not there. But it was <laughs> it was something I finally, I guess it was a tipping point. You know, it's it's death of a thousand cuts. We've heard it said. And it's just this, that. Over years, you, you, you wonder about this and you question that and this doesn't add up and that doesn't match up and this doesn't fit. And you tamp it down, you tamp it down, you push it aside. And finally, one of these days, you just go, wait just a fucking minute. <laughs> and it was kind of that way. And so I started really researching the origins of the Bible, the origins of the church. Um, oh, that's a big mistake. Yeah. yeah and, you, you know, there you go. I, my... Uh, my my sister-in-law was telling my wife at the time, don't let him read those things. That's bad. Uh -huh. you know. Right? <laughs> and uh, it's like, he's I gonna mean, she get... wasn't wrong. No, <laughs> she wasn't. And she knew where it would take me and she scared shitless. So I, you know, just after, after a, a couple of years, that wasn't a quick thing. It was not, it was excruciating. I was very thorough yeah. in my, in my journey. And I came yeah. to the, abrupt conclusion that well okay he's not there this isn't real the bible's just a book it's written by men it's all bullshit and i'm pissed yeah, <laughs> yeah. fortunately for you though uh you were among christians who obviously because they've been told by their god to be loving were nothing but kind and generous to you right that's got to be the case right uh, it is yeah i think that's everyone's experience right no, yeah, no, sure. no, no one pushes back they say okay that's fine whatever you think is cool want to go get pizza yeah. no no it was it was harsh uh, i lost a lot of friends lost uh, relationship with my daughters um oh, it, you know it's it's uh, people don't know what to do with it and so they uh, some people's uh, many people's response is to run and run and hide from it um, right. And, and I've come to the conclusion that many people do that because deep down somewhere, they're afraid it could happen to them and they cannot expose themselves to it. Yeah. Right. I, it's a tremendous amount of insecurity and, and uh, you know, fear that if you look too if you look too deeply in Mormonism, they call it their shelf breaking. Right. They just they, they put so much so much doubt and so much shit up on their shelf for years. And one day it all just breaks. Yeah, yeah, you know. and and people who knew me well, family and friends, they knew I was not in this thing half-hearted. It was, it was, I was all in all the way, and if right. someone like me who was all in um, could lose it, then what what's that mean for them? And so they just kind of skirt away from it and just kind of, I just thought of, I didn't want to look at that. Yeah. Well, and I, I think uh, it is a guess of mine that as we get in deeper into this conversation, we're going to find that that's a theme, that running away from uh, the scary parts of life and the, and, and the parts that, that we don't understand, it happens a lot with religious people. And, and you know, now, now that we're kind of at that point, Dave, maybe I can, I can take in the voice of one of your former friends or, or family members from the church, do you want to talk a little bit about how God is punishing you for your apostasy now? Yeah, yeah, I do. I really do. I really want to talk yeah. about that because that's that's an appropriate response to this. Um, you know, when I got the diagnosis, I did ask God to take it away, and He didn't. So, uh, no, I didn't. Oh, dick. I, dick move. I didn't actually. Dick move. Yeah. No, I. Uh, I don't think uh, I have. I've had people ask me. You know, um, you know the old phrase: "There's no atheist in foxholes." Um, which is bullshit yep yep and so i've had had people say okay well did you think then uh oh what if i've made a bad mistake what if it's what if it's mm. true and i and i believe i didn't I, I lost you know what what is what if what is this is god punning you know all that shit but no it didn't none of that stuff um came to me i, I didn't think that for a second right. so you, you've mentioned a diagnosis tell us what what have you been diagnosed with well, it's called ALS, which I can't pronounce what those words, letters stand for. <laughs> uh, people know it commonly as Lou Gehrig's disease. Um, and it's a fatal disease. You're given three to five years uh, to live. And it's a disease that attacks the uh, neuro neurological disease that attacks the, the muscles. The nerves quit, quit telling the muscles what to do, and so they just die. And um, it starts in the extremities, usually hands or feet. Sometimes it starts in the tongue. But eventually mm -hmm. it gets to all those areas um, and then to the lungs and then you die. 
Yeah. Well, that's not fun. No. That sounds no. like a less than fun thing to have uh, told that you're going that you're experiencing. Yeah, and the medical community does not offer a lot of hope, um, uh, as <laughs> as in zero. Um, so even even um, some drugs that are on the horizon, that are some therapies that in are in clinical trials and have shown to be some some shown some promise. Uh, the the by and large the medical community poo poos that and just tells you that there's really nothing we can do for you and you need to go ahead and put your clothes on and go home and die. Uh, they're, they're, they're kinder about it than that. Well, I, you know, <laughs> I'd say, fuck you. I'm leaving my clothes here. I'm going home. Naked. <laughs> you know, what do I have to lose? Right. Tell That's me right. what to do. I got time for the shit. <laughs> yeah. They don't really, they don't really have a lot of, uh, I mean, my, my neurologist that diagnosed me was, it was pretty much that abrupt. Yeah. You have oh, a, wow. you, shit. you have ALS. Um, and there was a pause there, and, and he says, I said, oh, okay, well, I wanted to know. And he said, okay, yeah, uh, well, your exit is right around that corner. The elevator's over there. What? And oh, I, my God. I said, uh, so you want me to put my clothes on? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. And Holy shit. And then he left. Uh, <laughs> that is a hell of a bedside manner right there. Yeah, <laughs> well, neurologists are kind of known for that. It's what I've come to understand. Um, wow. But no, uh, there's just you know there there wasn't any any um, I mean hell somebody that's not mentally as stable as I am I'm a stable genius by the way I don't know if that's in your show notes <laughs> or not excellent but, um, somebody who's really emotionally fragile they can go out and jump off a fucking bridge with that kind of thing you know yeah. you might want to offer a little emotional support here doc right <laughs> yeah. But that's right. the or, number or, for a therapist. Exactly. Right. Or di direct you somewhere where you can, you know, kind of wrap your head around this. Exactly. And, but no, that's just that's not so. the, the kind of thing that the medical community has done with ALS. It's just kind of this thing that they don't understand. And and there's not any treatment for it that's proven effective. There's no cure. It's it's kind of where HIV was 30 years ago or 20 years ago. You know, it's just that, oh, you got this. You're going to die. But right. but wow. they found a way to manage that. And there's there is hope. That they're finding so they will find something i, I believe i you know i believe in science you know? right, <laughs> science, right science usually figures it out you give them some you give enough time you know so at some point they'll they'll figure out some stuff ways to manage it and i'm just kind of hoping to buy enough time to to be a, in a part of that right so in in the meantime dave what is it you know you've kind of chosen uh a, a way to manage this uh, this experience. Do you want to talk about what that is and yeah, kind of how you yeah. decided the, to engage with this prognosis? Carpe the fucking diem. That's the phrase that I'm, I'm saying a lot. Um, and, it, you know, when I got the diagnosis, I, I'm, I was stunned. I, I knew that something was wrong with me, and I knew that that was certainly on the table. You know, the Google can be your best friend or worst enemy. So I knew that, right. I, yeah. I knew that this was in the in the cards, perhaps. But when I got it, I, okay, now I know what this is. Um, now I've got to decide what I want to do. And so what I did in pretty short order is I retired from working. I was doing it. Uh, yeah, I had an insurance business. And I shut that down and retired. I moved out of my apartment in with some friends. Um, and I began to sell things and, and streamline my life and simplify my life and just get myself in a position where I can live life the best I can um, as long as I can. And that's been, yeah. been my focus. Uh, travel to places you, I want to see. I just got back from Amalfi Coast, Italy two weeks ago. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, yeah. Spend time with people that I love and care about, you know, quality time with friends and loved ones and just soak up life and, and live life, live it hard, live it well as long as I can. And so that's kind of been my message and and to not uh get caught up in in the periphery that we get caught up in um that's that's the focus you know it's yeah. so funny because we get you th because that is funny the, the, <laughs> hilarious we get this in, we get we get this uh message from the religious uh segments of society that say well we have the answers when it comes to living and dying and we have we 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 know the real secrets and then you look at how their how their message affects them living their lives 
Mm-hmm. And the, what you just said is not what they come up with. That's totally. not the answer that they come up with. Well, no, it's not. And one reason I believe that is, and what I've seen in this process that I've had and been in the last few months is, and the, the difference in the way that the Christians respond to it and the way the atheists respond to it has been pretty stark. And, and I think the reason for that is, and it's what I've come to call uh, a, a fetish for the afterlife and, and cr- mm. the evangelical brand of Christianity has a fetish for the afterlife so much so that they they uh, lose sight of the beauty and, and and preciousness of this life and so when when everything is focused on the life to come and eternity by default it's going to minimize this life and so when they see this life ending they don't know what to do with that and so all they right. can do is say I'm praying for you and You'll go to a better place or whatever. Well, not in my case. I'm going to a worse place. But you would think right. you would think that they would that would they would ramp up their efforts to reach me, but they haven't. They've been it's been crickets. Wow. wow. Well, that's, that's insane. I mean, it's achingly tragic from the perspective of how they're wasting, as we're pretty certain, the one life they get. Right. It's it's deeply sad that even in you know what they would call your hour of need. They they don't know how to be available to you. And I've I've heard you talk on other shows, Dave, about how the difference between how your 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 the Christians in your life and the non believers in your life react differently. Yeah. And can you talk about that a little bit? Well it's just I guess the best I'll just give you a little anecdote. Uh, a few few weeks after the diagnosis, um I got a, an accidental phone call from my brother. My my older brother who led me into the Jesus movement is a an evangelical pastor in East Texas. Been doing that for mm-hmm. his whole life. And he's very conservative, very fundamentalist. Um, he he had texted me a day or so after and said, heard the news, brother, been praying ever since. Okay, well, thank you for that passive-aggressive fucking message because you know how I feel about that. <laughs> but I just said thanks right. and moved on. Um, I wanted to say, what are you praying, actually, you know? But I didn't. Yeah. So then I get this accidental phone call a couple weeks later from him, and, and it was just this weird, uh, I'll just kind of describe it as it, as, it, as it played out. I saw the, the name come up on my phone, and I saw it as a missed call. And so I just called him back. I said, oh, he tried to call me, and I didn't hear it, whatever. <clears throat> so I called him back, and I said, hey, brother, what's up? He said, oh, yeah, hey, Dave. Yeah, man, um... Yeah, I'm, I didn't mean to call you. I was trying to call my wife, and y'all's numbers are right next to each other, and I hit that by accident. And I said, okay. Okay, bye. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, I said, okay. And then I didn't say anything else, and I let that awkward silence hang there. And it felt like five minutes, but it was probably 20 seconds. There was nothing. He had nothing wow. to fucking say to his dying brother. A Weird. fucking and, and, uh, and I, all the people uh, a pastor exactly should, should you be talk able for to, a living. Yeah, um, summon up some fucking compassion or something. Just lie about it. Just lie and say, "Oh, we're praying for you. We're we love you. We love you. you I'm know. so sorry. You know anything?" But no, I didn't, and I didn't bail him out of this awkward silence. I just said, "Oh," because I knew it was happening immediately, and I just kind of. I probably had a smile on my face. I was probably <laughs> I was probably enjoying it way too much, but I could just see that there was this awkward tone there. He doesn't know what to say. He doesn't he knows that he can't go into his religious diatribe with me because I we've tr- we've done a couple of those since my deconversion and it wasn't pretty. You're immune. It wasn't yeah. pretty. It, it, we're both very opinionated. We both he knows I can go toe to toe with him on all of that shit. So he tries. Of course, he can. He tends to avoid that now. So mm. he had nothing to say. He didn't, you know. So finally, he said, uh, "Yeah. So uh, how are you?" <laughs> and I said, <laughs> "I said, well, I'm dying, uh, oh. but other than that, I'm fine." <laughs> <laughs> other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? Yeah, exactly. And he said, "Oh yeah, yeah, man. Oh, really sorry." Um, anyway, yeah, I didn't mean to call you. Uh, and he was trying wow. to, and he started trying to back out and close it down and I didn't bail him out. I just, but I, he hung up and, and, and I haven't heard from him since that oh was probably God. two months ago. And, uh, I thought, what the actual hell, what is wrong with these people? You know? Yeah. And there's so- just no sense of how to embrace me in this moment. Whereas my atheist friends, they're like, Dave, 
we love you. We're heartbroken. Let me come hang out with you. Come hang out with us. Let's go do this. Let's go do that. They're calling me. They're texting me. Hey, man, thinking about you today. Um, how are you feeling? You know, just letting me know that they're thinking about me. That's really, you know, and they'll say things like, dude, I have no words, you know, but I'm just thinking about you. And you know what? That's the truth. There are no words. But at right, least right. say, I have no words. Don't just not have words. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think that's interesting because what it shows is that, like, you know, th- I, I feel like what it shows is that the religious people, if you don't buy into their cosmology, they literally don't know how to human anymore. That's like, right. They have, yeah. lost, they have lost touch with the here and the now. Exactly. And I think those of us who have given up on religion have come to terms with the fact that here and now is all we fucking have. Exactly. No, so I think you nailed origin... it. You nailed it. They, oh, don't not, they don't know how to human anymore. They don't know how to be human. They're so yeah. caught up in their in their ideology and their fantasy world, and it's so focused on heaven and the afterlife or hell if you're bent that way. But they don't know how to be human. They don't know how to connect on a human level. And so, because they don't know how, and because it's so fucking awkward, they just don't do it. It's just a right, void. Yeah. Just avoid it. So yeah. is the origin of your dispute with your brother, you're the falling out with your brother, is that because of your uh, departure from religion? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. When I, what a when tragedy. he first when he first knew, I mean, he doesn't shun me. If I called him, he'd answer and we'd have a conversation. But we have nothing to talk about because he's, right. con- he's concerned that I'm, I'm going to hell. And when, we, when I first went through this process and he knew I'd lost my faith and was calling myself an atheist, he was all up in my business trying to reconvert me and trying to persuade me and convince me that I was, well, Dave, have you thought about this? And I said, yes, a hundred times. Have you thought about this? Yes, a thousand times. What about this? Well, you don't know what that means. And so we would have these <laughs> two or three hour knockdown drag out and, mm. and neither one would budge. And so it became this stalemate of, okay, I'll just leave you alone then. And that's kind of sure, where it's yeah. at. It's been there for several years now. I, f- I well, feel like the first phase of new atheism is banging your head against a bunch of other people's walls. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and and then finally just learning that those walls are pretty impregnable. Yeah, so, yeah. Right. Don't waste so your time. I, you know, I have a kind of a follow up to the, the the way your brother. You know, that the anecdote with your brother and everything. And I think. Uh, this is usually important. We're, look, we're all going to die. We're all in the process because you know, wait, what? Death, death begins at perce- at at, at uh, conception. You asshole. That's, so that's right. Um, so, but for those of us who are a little bit behind, and there's a loved one going there ahead of us, you know, a friend going there ahead of us. Do you have advice to give to people how to be the best friend, to be the best kind of ally, to be the best kind of you know partner in this process? Just be present. Um, be be mindfully present. Um, again, it's 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 easy. It's okay to say I don't have words, and then just be there and sit there, and and just be willing to to ride that out with you. I've got a group of friends in Nashville. They're all ex-Christian atheists. Three, four of us are ex-clergy. Um, mm-hmm. Wow. And they're truly my best friends in this world. And and. Um, and then my, my girlfriend, Bevan, she's right alongside and we're, you know, walking through this together and she's doggedly searching for anything and everything that can prolong the days. And I'm all, I'm all about that. Uh, my, my friends in, in, this gives you a classic example of a, of a, a moment that the things that I've, that I talk about all the time and grabbing the moments and making the most of them. Um, these buddies, three of these buddies were out the other night several weeks ago maybe a couple months ago i can't remember now and just having a drink and talking and i think there was a ball game on we were out at a bar and um and and uh brian my my buddy one of my buddies ex-pastor says dave i just i just want to ask you something and and i said what he said can can i have permission to be there with you at the end Hmm. wow And I said, um, "Are you serious? You want you want to do that?" And he said, "It would be an honor." 
Wow. And the other two guys said, me too. We want to be there. <laughs> and that is what it means to be present with someone. Is to be fully engaged and unafraid and courageous enough because they're the ones, you know, that have to deal with the shit, you know, and I'm the one moving on and they got to then pick up the pieces and move on and that's that's some hard stuff. Right. But yeah. They wanted to just they're embracing it. They're not afraid of it. And and I just I find that kind of love and courage to be so inspiring. Do you think he's just trying to jump ahead in the will? <laughs> yeah. I guess is what I'm, <laughs> he wants first dibs of whatever's in the room. Yeah. He he just wants to take my watch and yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no. oh and there'll God. probably be some pills there that he's after <laughs> if I know this guy. Well, so. he's my uh he's actually my supplier for anything of any contraband anyway, so he's already got nice. He's, he's already got that going on. We'll we'll edit that out. We'll we'll cut that. Yeah. Out. We'll <laughs> Spending some beautiful days in jail. Yeah, what's so his, what's them. his phone number? Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. <laughs> um, well, that's that's uh, pretty amazing. Yeah. So so, that, t- so, oh, go ahead. Well, that's just the kind of people I'm surrounded by, and you know, we we mentioned the documentary, and one of the big things I want to I want to try to show if we get this documentary going, I want footage of of atheists. I want people to know that atheists are good people. I want this right. this whole notion of the word atheist being a dirty word. I want that gone, and and the only way we're going to get rid of it is is to is to speak about it openly and 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 to say yes, I'm an atheist. It just simply means I don't believe in God. I'm not a bad person. I'm kind. I'm loving. I mean, the people that I'm living with, the people I live with in in the Nashville area, they're atheists. They're they're you know how can they be kind and loving? They they don't believe in right. God. Well, how can they have morals? You know. Right. Yeah. And and I just want to show that that you guys need to people need to see that atheists are good people, period. End of story. Yeah. Well, I mean, there there are some shitty atheists out there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's, we... there's more shitty Christians. <laughs> <laughs> just you by, know what? I'll take just it. Just by sheer I'll numbers, that has to be true, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> this, it's a volume game. It's a volume. I'll totally it's take it. It's a numbers that. game, man. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> On the subject of of like I've had people tell me I'm being inspiration to them and they think about, you know, my perspective on things. So what we have a local in Nashville, a local group of ex Christian atheists who we it's kind of a meetup, a support group, if you will. And we there's probably fifty of them in the in the group, but on any given month we'll have a meeting of fifteen or twenty people. And uh it's really great. People just check in on how the life is going, what's going on in their lives, that sort of thing. But uh, we had a meeting about a week after the diagnosis, and and everybody was, it was it was really an emotional night, and people were just talking about how it was affecting them and and what they were thinking about and stuff like that. A lot of tears, a lot of crying, because um, I'm a big fucking deal, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, one of the girls, uh, one of the ladies. Uh, Actually, her and her husband met us over there in Italy. We 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 saw them in Italy in Naples, <clears throat> but she was just talking about uh, going through one of her typical days and just getting frustrated about stuff in life that happens. And she caught herself and she paused and she said, "What would how would Dave do about this? How would Dave handle this? Would he get upset, frustrated? I mean, he's dying. Come on, he wouldn't." So she kind of it had a different perspective on the the. Uh, annoying things that happen in everyday life and then someone oh, across, someone across the room said yeah what would dave do and then someone else yelled out yeah wwdd and they <laughs> said we made bracelets we need bracelets <laughs> <laughs> so we we now have wwdd bracelets that are um are focused on that thought okay how how to how to carpe the fucking diem how to think more thoughtfully about capturing the moments, not getting caught up in the mundane. And, and so we have those like on the website and stuff, and it's just kind of a fun thing we're doing. We're going to use money that comes in. If people buy them, there people want to buy them. I've had people reach out and say, Dave, we want to buy some bracelets. I want to give them away. And, you know, I'm kind of, it, it was kind of weird at first for me, but I thought, you know what, it's been fun. And, and it's, we're using the proceeds for, uh, medical costs as needed and ALS research, which is always needed. And 
stuff like that. So it's just a fun thing that kind of came out of people's experience uh, with with reacting to this. Um, and again, it's just it's an example of how the atheists can just they can just embrace it and and go with it and not be afraid it. of it and not be in denial of it. Hmm. Well, and and uh, we'll we'll have uh, links to all of that. Yeah, in, yeah. in the show notes. Yeah, sounds good. So, Dave, I, I I just I just so you carpe fucking diem is your is is your credo. Right. I want to know how are you doing that? In what way? What what are you doing to get out there and 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 grab the bull by the horns and seize the day? Well, uh, an example is the trip to Italy because you know um, um, one mindset would say that's too hard travel. Travel is hard. Uh, it gets harder as time goes on, and international right. travel is is exponentially harder. Um, and so, I had moments over there when, you know, I overdid it, and and I uh, there was one day the the, the hotel or Santa was just on this cliffside on the Amalfi Coast, and it's just like. 500 steps straight down to the beach <laughs> and, oh, no. and perfect for a guy with ALS. Exactly. I, and I had the, I had to make a decision. Um, okay. That's going to really do a number on me. Um, and, and it's going to, it's going to put me out of commission the next day, pretty much. You know, I'm going to have to recover a day after that. And I had to make a decision. Do I want to put myself through that to get down to the water and, ex and, and explore that and have some moments there, or do I want to just nah? It's too easy. I'm going to stay the. I'm going to go the comfortable route. Well, I, I just the, the 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 carpe the fucking diem in. Okay, I've got a day here. I can seize this day, or I can take the safe, comfortable route and avoid this. And so I just I walked down the steps, and I had a couple hours down at the beach. Had a had a drink. Had a cigar. Visited with my mm. friends. Had a beautiful day on the Mediterranean Ocean in Italy. And then climbed those stairs and was was tired and sore the next day, but I had that beautiful memory. I had those wonderful moments, and that to me is an example of of carpe the fucking diem. I love it. Well, well, I think that's as beautiful a place as any to uh, to leave this conversation for now. And hopefully, you'll come back and have another one with us uh, soon, Dave. That'd be fun. You guys are you guys are fun. We're the worst. <laughs> yeah. Just admit it. You're the worst. We're the worst. Yeah. So. <laughs> I want to know this. Don't... When when did you as Mormons, uh, ex Mormons, realize you could say fuck and nothing bad would happen? <laughs> <laughs> Younger than you think, I think. <laughs> good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We didn't we never so, said we were good at being Mormons. We just said we were that. Oh so yeah, okay. That's well right. <laughs> I've been I've been accused of overusing the fucking word fucking and so I think it's because I'm making up for all those years when I really couldn't say it, except in that's secret. Right. Well yeah. I, I just love I just love that now that you now you can look anybody you want in the eye, if they call you out on saying fuck him, just be like, I'm fucking dying, man. I can do whatever exactly. the fuck I want. <laughs> yeah. I, I play that card all the time. <laughs> yeah. I love what an it. asshole. Who says a dying man can't be an asshole? And I think that's what we've gleaned from today's conversation. Right? <laughs> yeah. that, what a be, dick. that should be the summary of the show right there. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Exactly. What a prick. Well, Dave, thank you so much for joining us. What a terrific, amazing uh, story. And again, we want to have you back uh, anytime you want to come back and let us don't, know. Don't, don't waste your time on this show. Don't, yeah, literally. <laughs> carpe diem and get out there and don't do this show again. But if you want yeah. to, we're here for you. Yeah, yeah, we'll man. get the, we'll get the documentary and the book done and make another round of of shows. That'd be fun. That'd be great. Right, That'd be I love great. it. Best of luck with Thank all that. Thank you, buddy. Bye-bye. All right, thanks, Dave. Bye. Bye.